It's my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. And I will do what it says I can do. Today I'll be taught the Word of God. I boldly confess. My mind is alert. My heart is receptive. I'm about to receive the incorruptible, indestructible, ever-living seed of the Word of God. I'll never be the same. Never, never, never. Never be the same. In Jesus' name. Amen. I would like all of those that have served in the armed forces and are currently serving, or have served, doesn't make any difference, I'd like you to stand up if you would and just remain standing. We're going to pray. First of all, we want to say thank you. Let's give them a, a round of applause. And let's bow our heads. Lord, as we remember those who have made that ultimate sacrifice for the freedoms that we enjoy every day here, we think about how they have followed in the footsteps of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. In the same way that he sacrificed his life that we might have freedom, many of our Americans right here have sacrificed their lives, and we want to recognize them more than just putting a flower on a grave. We want to say thank you for them. And I thank you, Lord, for all those uh, servicemen and women that currently serve or have served uh, that, are, that are still here, Lord. We, we hold our servicemen and women in our hearts, and we pray that you'd hold them in your strong arms. Cover them with your sheltering grace and with your presence and stand in the gap for their protection. We also remember the families of our troops. We ask for your unique blessings to fill their homes. We pray for your peace and provision, strength, and comfort because you are called the God of all comfort. May that all of that fill their lives today. May the members of your armed forces be supplied with courage to face each day. May they trust in your mighty power to accomplish each task that's put before them. And Lord, we pray that you let our military brothers and sisters feel our love and our support. We thank you that at this church, Lord, we recognize how important sacrifice is from Jesus Christ to all those that sacrifice their lives today for the cause of freedom. We recognize that. And we are a church, Lord, that stands for your word and still stands for our flag. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hallelujah. We are... Uh, what do you think I'm going to preach on today? The Great Commission. And you know, I'm going to preach on the Great Commission until we get it. And do you know how I know we'll get it? We'll actually be involved. Now, we have a lot of outreaches here, and I'm glad for everything that everybody does here. But I want to tell you that every day of my life and everything that I do, it's an outreach. For everybody I talk to, and every door that's opened, I preach Thursday night on the scripture that says there's a great and effectual door is opened. But it doesn't do any good for God to open up doors for us if we don't walk through them. Amen. So we need to be walking through the doors that God opens up so we can love on people, help people, preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, witness to them. Uh, you have something to share with them. You have to share uh, as we get into it today, you'll see that you've been brought from the darkness and into the marvelous light. And so you can share that with other people. Amen. So we're going to look at an interesting character right now in Acts 26. You know, in this group of scriptures, Paul's sharing how that the Lord had met him on the road to Damascus and commissioned him to take the gospel to the heathen. In other words, aren't you glad today that the gospel went forward to the heathen? 
Oh, I'm sorry, did I call you heathens? <laughs> In Acts 26, we're reading out of the New Living Translation. Uh, then King Agrippa said to Paul, you may speak in your defense. So Paul, gesturing with his hand, started his defense. I'm fortunate, King Agrippa, that you are the one hearing my defense today against all these accusations made by the Jewish leaders. For I know that you are an expert on all Jewish customs and controversies. I love him. That's not manipulation. That's good salesmanship. I love telling people that. If I'm going to invite them to do something inside the church, I'm going to tell them about how I can tell that they're so called to it and how great they are at it, you know. But anyway, now please listen to me patiently, Paul says. As the Jewish leaders are well aware, I was given a thorough Jewish training from my earliest childhood among my own people and in Jerusalem. If you remember in another scripture, he said, I was raised under the strictest sect of the Pharisees under Gamaliel. If they would admit it, they'd know that I have been a member of the Pharisees, the strictest sect of our religion. Now, I'm on trial because of my hope in the fulfillment of God's promise made to our ancestors. I understand that the New Testament isn't a... Uh, I, I hate it when people preach, well, people didn't do right so that God had to do something different. It, it was always the plan for God from the beginning of time to send Jesus for our salvation. He's not doing it reacting to man. He's doing it because it was always his plan. That's why he talks about it in Genesis even. Amen? But so Paul's saying, listen, all I'm doing is going around preaching about what the, the Old Testament said all along. In fact, that's why the 12 tribes of Israel zealously worship God night and day, and they share the same hope I have. Yet, your majesty, they accuse me for having this hope. The problem is the Jews didn't understand the hope when it hit them in the face. They had this hope, but the realization, the answer to their dreams was there. And yet they didn't recognize Jesus. So Paul goes on, Why does it seem incredible to any of you that God can raise the dead? I used to believe that I ought to do everything I could to oppose the very name of Jesus, the Nazarene. Indeed, I did just that in Jerusalem. Authorized by the leading priest, I caused many believers there to be sent to prison, and I cast my vote against them when they were condemned to death. If you'll remember that the Bible says that he was consenting, he was consenting unto Stephen's being stoned to death. He was right there. So at any rate, in the 11th verse, many times I had them punished in the synagogues to get them to curse Jesus. That was his purpose. Paul wanted to get them, to, to get them away from Jesus and wanted to get him to curse Jesus. So when Paul, he was called Saul then, but he, but, but he tried, he was coming against Christ. He said, I was so violently opposed to them that I even chased them down in foreign cities. That word foreign cities really means uh, in, uh, 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 in King James says strange, but it means foreign cities. But I want to tell you that one word is an interesting word. Uh, and being exceedingly mad, it says in the King James, but that word is emanomai, and it means maniac, raging at. So let me tell you, he was really angry and coming against the people of God for believing in Christ. Amen? And, and if they would renounce Jesus, they'd be allowed to live. So Paul became as an insane man in his zeal against the Lord. He was driven by demonic madness to many cities outside of Israel to persecute the church of Jesus. In the 12th verse, he says, One day I was on such a mission to Damascus, armed with the authority and commission of the leading priest. Whereupon, in madness, as I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priest, about noon, your majesty, as I was on the road, a light from heaven, brighter than the sun. Everyone say, brighter than the sun. A light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shone down on me and my companions. So there's only one type of light that's brighter than the sun, and that's the glory of God. So the glory of God shone so brightly, didn't just affect Paul, it affected everybody that was with him. We all fell down, and I heard a verse saying, I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It's useless for you to fight against my will. Falling to the ground, did you know that's a natural reaction to coming in contact with the glory of God? In 2, Corinthians 5, 13, uh, 2 Chronicles 5, 13 and 14, they did that when they dedicated the temple. And Paul 
uh, was the only one who heard the voice, but everyone saw the glory of God, saw the light on that day. By persecuting people, Paul was persecuting the Lord. Here's an interesting thing. When you're out there preaching the gospel or you're trying to witness, you're trying to live the Christian life, when people persecute for the, you for that, remember, they're really persecuting Jesus. You may feel like they're persecuting you, but they're really coming against the Lord, and the Lord will answer that. Did you know that? The Bible says, Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. So Saul was so hardened through hearing uh, Stephen and the other ministers the Lord had to do something drastic to reach out to him. Maybe the Lord had to do something drastic to reach out to you, too. In the 15th verse, Paul, Saul says this to, to, to the voice that's coming at him. Well, who are you, Lord? I asked. And the Lord replied, I am Jesus, the one you're persecuting. So Saul understood the Lord was talking to him. But as most religious people... He didn't know who the Lord was. How many of you know there's a whole lot of people attending church today that don't know who the Lord is? I mean, they know how to go to church. They know how to pay their tithes. Some of them know how to read their little Sunday book quarterly, which we don't have here, but they, they, they have their Sunday quarterlies. They read their little lessons. They go through all of that. They may even know, they know how to cook great dinners. They bring the food to the church because everyone knows that breaking bread is very important in a church. And then having good soup to dip the bread in. You know, all of that. But these religious people that he was around, they didn't, and, and Paul himself, he didn't, he didn't know who the Lord was. He just knew about him. But he soon found out that Jesus is Jehovah and Jesus is the Messiah. Now, then God speaks to him. He said, now get to your feet. You know, I'm going to tell you something. When God says, get to your feet, I guarantee you, you get to your feet. Now get to your feet, for I have appeared to you to appoint you as my servant and witness. Tell people that you've seen me, and tell them what I show you in the future. There's some real promises here. He's saying this right here. You are, first of all, going to learn what it is to be a servant. Second of all, you're going to learn what it is to be a witness. To the things that I do. But there's something else. I'm going to give you some instruction now. But I'm going to give you revelation. And I'm going to continue to instruct you. That's why he said what I will show you in the future. This isn't the only time that God's going to speak to Paul is it? Rise stand on your feet. So Paul really didn't have any more answers for Jesus. Stood to his feet. He quietly believed. You are reading about the conversion of Paul right now. He quietly believed and rose up a new man. The minute you recognize Jesus as Savior, you rise up a new man. You can't become a new man. You are a new man. So he rose up a new man. He had a new purpose, a new commission. I told this story before, and I'm going to say it again because it was one of the greatest times that I've run onto this. Uh, uh, when I was driving my people around in the car, Uber that I do, the Uber car I do a couple times a week, there was a, uh, a gal that got in it that was inside. She started talking. I don't mean normal talking, jackhammer talking. I mean, she started talking from the time she sat in that back seat, and she didn't shut up till we were 30 minutes later where I was taking her. And she told me her whole life. Now, understand... It's not unusual for me to be nosy, but I hadn't asked her anything yet. <laughs> and so she just told me her whole life as we're going along there. And then we get down to uh, closer to home, and her story had been this. Her story had, she had a great family. She had a couple of kids and a, and a husband. And she had a job where she took care of somebody who was terminally ill. And she said when he died, after taking care of him for nine years, it's her job, when he died, she lost everything. She left her husband and her kids, divorced his, her husband, and she goes, I just went crazy. I don't even understand why. So now we're probably not ten minutes from her home. 
And she says, I don't know what happened. Well, I do. She goes, you do. Do you want to tell me? I said, can I speak now? <laughs> and she goes, yeah, go ahead. So I said, well, here's the deal, hon. What happened is for nine years, you knew what your purpose was. For nine years, your purpose was just to take care of this man and make his life a little bit easier. And when he died, you lost your purpose. And I said, man does not do well without purpose. Now, I'm going to tell you something else. Do you know, I think that's why some people who retire don't live very long. Because they lose, they lose their challenge. They lose their purpose. There's nothing to, you know, to fill their life. And purpose is very important to us. We need to know why we're here. There may be people right here in this room. You go to church. You go to your job every day. You think you, but, but the problem is you don't really know what your purpose is. If we really want to find out what our purpose is, we need to go to the one who created us. Does that make sense? We need to know the one who created us. You know, uh, I remember years ago, uh, I stopped to get gas at this place, and there was somebody going to some kind of, uh, I'm probably not saying it right, but some kind of rainbow camp out or something. And so I said, well, what are you getting ready to do? We're going to get high, we're going to drop some acid, we're going to find out why we're here. And I wanted to tell him, well, by experience, I can tell you, you won't find it that way. <laughs> but God really, God will give you the words to say at a time like that. And they were in the typical hippie bus, you know, headed to this big rally. So I told him, I said, well, do you know what? Anytime you're trying to find the purpose of something, don't you have to go way back to when and where it was created? And he looked at me and said, I suppose, well, because only the one who made it can really know what the purpose is. So he looks at me and I said, see, we were created by God. And you can get as high as you want. But the truth about it is you'll never know your purpose until you get in touch with God. And he goes, when I go there, that's what I'll do. Well, you don't have to go there to do it. Because nowhere in the Bible does it say drop a little acid and and you'll meet God <laughs> I ran into another time of the, the guy who was the drummer for Willie Nelson I went and played my sax and sang years ago at the dedication of the largest cross in the Midwest is in Groom Texas 19 stories tall and uh, so at the de dedication of that cross they wanted me to come do music so I did that and uh, as I was talking to him, I said, I bet you've had some extraordinary things go on here while building it. And he said, yes. They said, the drummer for Willie Nelson pulled in here when they saw us stand this thing up. And, 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 and I said, what do you want? He told us that he was headed up into the mountains. And we said, what are you headed up to the mountains for? We're headed up to the mountains because I'm going up to the mountains because I want to get real high. I figure I can find God there. And they told him, no, God's everywhere. He's right here. And you can meet God right here at the base of this cross where you're standing. And they led that drummer to the Lord. You see, we all have purpose. Uh, I'm going to get on with this in just a second, but I want to stay here for just a moment. I've said this before, and I want to say it again. There are some people that float through life and never find their purpose. So they look for it in power and sex and, and drugs and alcohol. and They look for it. You can't find purpose there. Because you have to go to your creator to find your purpose. Now somebody asked me when the last time I preached on it, they said, well, how, uh, how, did, how did you find your purpose? Well, God revealed his purpose, and if you're open to it, he'll reveal your purpose in life to you. Because he's not some kind of trickster God. People act like he's some kind of trickster. He, like he's going like this, come on, guess. <laughs> nope, that's not it. Try something else. That's not him. He said, call on me and I will answer you. Amen. I wanted to know what my purpose was, and I know what my purpose My purpose, I, everybody in this room was created at this time in, in, through eternity 
for one particular thing because you answer a problem that nobody else can answer like you can answer. They said, well, what problem do you answer? I answer this problem that comes out of Romans, the 10th chapter. How shall they know lest there be a preacher? So I was created, born June 4th, 1953, so that I could grow up and be that preacher. How shall they know unless there be a preacher? There are a lot of them. All of us are called. If we're called, we're called to that purpose, to preach the gospel. Now, what's your purpose? See, right here we find that Paul is not finding out. He didn't find out in religion, even though he was raised under the strictest sect of the Pharisees under Gamaliel. He did not find his purpose there, did he? But he's getting ready to find it here. So God is speaking to him, and he says, he tells them that he's called them. And in the 17th verse said, And I will rescue you from both your own people and the Gentiles. Yes, I'm sending you to the Gentiles. Well, you have to understand that a Jew didn't believe that a Gentile was really a, a human being like them. Very poor opinion of them. And uh, so I love this. He says, I'm calling you. But I'm going to have to rescue you from your own people and the Gentiles. Oh, my God. I'm sure Paul was thinking, can't you call me to something where you won't have to rescue me from? Can't you call me to serve ice cream down at the Dairy Queen? But Paul will be supernaturally delivered from those people. Then he goes on to say this in the 18th verse. Uh, God is speaking to him, and he says, why is he calling them? To open their eyes. Say that. Open their eyes. Yeah. To open their eyes so they may turn from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God. Then they'll receive forgiveness for their sins and be given a place among God's people who are set apart by faith in me. The thing, only thing that sets you apart by, is faith in God, in Christ, nothing else. The only thing that sanctifies a human being is placing your faith in Jesus Christ. Not in religion. Paul had already done that. You could put your faith in Bob Caps and you're going to be sorely disappointed. You could put your faith in Heart of God Fellowship, but I guarantee you at some point you're going to be dis disappointed. But if you really put your faith in Jesus, you'll never be disappointed. Unbelievers, he said, to open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light from the power, which is the word excusia, which means authority, from the authority of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness or remission of sins and inheritance among them, which are sanctified. Unbelievers have been blinded by sin. They've been blinded by Satan. But the word of God brings light, it says in Ephesians 1. With the entrance of the gospel and repentance, their eyes are opened. And they can see the word, the light, and they can walk towards it. He said to open their eyes. I want to show you something here. 2 Corinthians 4, 4 and Ephesians 4, 18. I'm going to read those. I have them written down in the King James. But in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, Paul said this. In whom the God of this world, that's little g, because he's talking about Satan, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. The world has blinders on them that keeps them from seeing the gospel, from the true light. Our job is to take those blinders off by preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ to them. So they can see the light, glorious light of the gospel. Amen. So they can come from darkness and into light. Now, if, if I'm going to be one of those people that's going to bring, be used by God to bring people from darkness and into light, then we're going to read here in a minute that I better walk as a child of light and not walk like I'm still a child of darkness. Ephesians 4.18 talks about the unbeliever, says, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that's in them because of the blindness of their heart. If you witness to some people, you'll see them get this look on their face. 
you're talking to them about Jesus, and they're looking at you like, and you don't know whether to slap them or what to bring them back out to. Debbie wanted to slap me yesterday. I was in the car. She went into Walmart, and evidently I was falling asleep, but I still had my eyes open. So I guess I was leaning over, and I was looking out, and she, was, she opened the door. She thought I was dead. She goes, babe, babe, hey, babe, what, what, what? She goes, my God, don't do that. <laughs> I said, what was going through your head? She goes, I was thinking about the, your motorcycles, how I was going to sell them to get a little bit of money. And <laughs> <laughs> no, she didn't think. <laughs> One of Satan's strategies is to blind a person to the reality of their own condition. That's why, you know, when I was an alcoholic, it was very hard for me to come to the place where I could admit I was an alcoholic. If you've ever been an alcoholic or an addict, th there are things that you'll say when you first start, when people first start to talk to you, you'll say, I'm not an alcoholic. I can quit any time I want. And you really need somebody who's a friend enough with you to say, well, you're an idiot. No. To everyone else, it's obvious. Everyone knows you're an alcoholic. Your family, your friends know it. But you keep insisting there's no problem. It's hard for them to get to a place. But let me tell you something. Whether I want you to hear this. Whether you're admitting you're an alcoholic and you're powerless over that problem or whether you're admitting that you're an addict and you're powerless over that problem, now listen to me, or you're admitting that you're a sinner and you're powerless over that problem, we have to admit our human condition before we can move on and get better. I want to tell you there's a narrow gate. The Bible says straight is the way and narrow is the gate that leads to everlasting life. And few there be that find it. Do you know why few there be that find it? Because they're blinded by the enemy. It's true that all religions lead to God, but not the God, the Father, the Creator of the universe. There's only one way to come to the true God. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. A person without Christ needs to be pitied. Why? He's walking in darkness. Listen, Jesus, I believe it's in the ninth chapter, the 35th verse or something like that in Matthew. He sees the multitude, and he sees this suffering multitude around him. And he, rather than be judgmental of them, he sees them as sheep with no shepherd. And he wants to, he has compassion, and he wants to make a difference in their life. When I look out in this world, listen, I'm sorely disappointed in this world. I, I'm sorely disappointed. I see the things that we call, uh, I said it earlier, the things that God calls evil, we call good. But something about getting those blinders taken off of you is kind of weird. Do you know why? All of a sudden you get to see yourself as who you are, and you get to see God for who he is. And it takes both those things. Then he says to turn them from darkness to light. The kingdom of God is a kingdom of light. The world today is wrapped up in the kingdom of darkness. I'm appalled, and you ought to be too. When Paul went into Athens, he was appalled at the things that he saw, idol worship and everything else. I'm appalled at the darkness of the world today. I can't conceive some of the things that you see in the news media. When I see some father who has molested his daughter or some other little kid, uh, my mind can't conceive that. What in the world's going through his head? When I find somebody that, that steps up there at a tower somewhere and with a gun and starts randomly killing people, as Christians, we can't conceive that. We, what? But their, their hearts and their minds are blinded by darkness, by Satan. I don't expect anything but darkness to come from darkness. But I don't expect anything but light to come from children of light. 
be offended by this when I say this, please. But I cannot imagine in my mind the darkness of a man's mind who would rather make love to another man than to another woman. Do what? When the Bible's clear about it all through that, not just Old Testament, New Testament too. In Romans 1, it said that, that God turned them over to their own passions uh, uh, because they wouldn't, they wouldn't follow him and recognize him as God. He turned them over to their own passions that he told them this. He said, I let them do what they wanted to do. Men with burning in lust for other men and women weren't burning in lust and doing things that are, not, that are not good and receiving the reward in their own bodies for what they're doing. I can answer this problem about about, uh, oh, I, I, did you guys see that in Facebook the other day? I thought it was so good. Somebody put something in Facebook I thought was so good. It said, uh, I, ad- I, I identify mentally, emotionally, as a very rich man. <laughs> but I don't have any money, so if you'll send me some money, I can start walking in my identity. <laughs> Another old man put on there not too long ago, if you're having gender identity, open your pants and look inside. <laughs> if you're having a crisis there, you know. I'm, gonna be on, I'm just being honest. I don't want to lie to you about it. I could lie to you and try to tell you something you want to hear or uh, the way the rest of the world talks, but I'm not going to do that. I can't conceive in my mind the millions and millions of babies that have been murdered because the Supreme Court said murder is okay when it comes to a baby. Do you know the last time I said that, you know, well, not the last time, but the time before that, we had somebody get it and walk out. They were mad. Called me and said, I can't believe you'd come against that. A woman has a right to do what she wants with her body. With her body, yes, but not the body that's inside of her body. Amen. You know that's true because if I, if, if, I, if I get drunk and run into some woman who's pregnant... I have two counts of murder against me. But she can murder that baby, and it's okay. If you've had an abortion, this isn't saying this to condemn you. I thank God for the forgiveness and grace of Christ. But I just want to tell you, call it what it is. The body of Christ has got to stand up for what is right. I can't conceive the millions of babies that have been killed destroyed in our land by government consent and sometimes by government subsidies, but that's coming to a halt. But the same government will fine you heavily and possibly imprison you if you destroy an eagle's egg or kill a kangaroo rat. Kill a human being, but not an endangered species. There's something radically wrong with the government that will protect an unborn eagle, but not an unborn child. Okay, I'll move on. Paul was commanded by Jesus to bring men into the light. Darkness is always a symbol for evil. Light is a symbol for purity. To the Ephesians, Ephesians Paul said, for ye were, in Ephesians 5, 8, For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord, Walk as children of light. Jesus said that men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. There's always a sharp contrast. You're either walking in darkness. Let me go ahead and make this clear. You're either walking in darkness or you're walking in light. There's no gray area there. Do you understand what I'm saying? Do you know right now if you feel condemned about some action in your life, then turn around. If right now, if your heart is saying to yourself, I need to have some changes in your life, then just change. The most powerful thing that we have as believers is the ability to change our mind and go a different direction. You were darkness, but now you are light, so walk as children of light. Then he said he was going to turn them from the power of Satan unto God. You were at one time held by the power of Satan. You were a slave to, to sin. Jesus died to break that slavery to sin. You've been freed from it. You have no excuse for sinning. The most natural thing for a believer to do is to walk in holiness because God lives on the inside. 
Jesus and only Jesus, I want to tell you this morning, can free you from the hold that sin has on your life. The Bible says that if the Son sets you free, you shall be free indeed. The Bible doesn't say if the Son gets you out of darkness, you'll periodically have to visit darkness again. You don't have to be in darkness ever again. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm light. That's all I'll ever be. You want to be free from the evil desires that brought you into bondage? That's what the gospel is for. In the 19th verse, he said, And so, King Agrippa, I obeyed that vision from heaven. I'm, I'm going on with just a little bit because a couple of verses here, then I'm going to quit because I want you to see something here. He didn't just get the calling from God. He didn't say, God didn't tell him, I, Listen, I'm calling you to the Gentiles and the Jews, and I'm going to call you in such a way that, you, that you can, uh, you, you're going to be used to open up their eyes. You're going to bring them from the power of Satan into the power of God, uh, from, the, from, power, from the power of darkness into the marvelous light. Uh, that's what your job's going to be. Yes, you're going to receive persecution, but I want to let you know you're going to be successful because I'm going to protect you and deliver you from those people that would hurt you. So he's going through all of this stuff right here, but the reality of it is, did you know whose choice it was to follow that calling? It was Paul. You have a calling on your life and you have a purpose for your life, but it's always your choice whether you follow that or you decide, hey, I'm going to do whatever I want with my life. Today, I want you to realize that you were called, you were born on the date that you were born to live in this time because you have a purpose that God has called you to that's greater than any other purpose you may have in your life. And so Paul says, and so King Agrippa, I obeyed that vision from heaven, whereupon God visiting instructed me, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto that heavenly vision. I pre preached first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem and throughout all Judea, and also to the Gentiles, that all must repent of their sins and turn to God and prove that they've changed by the good things they do. Let me tell you this. One of the proofs that you know, that you know Christ is there some, kind of, there's some kind of fruit in your life? Sometimes I have people say, well, I know I'm not living for God, but I'm saved. And I want to go, the chances are you're not saved at all if you're not living for God. I'm not saying that believers don't make mistakes and they go the wrong direction sometimes. But I want to tell you something. If, 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 if you don't have any sense of sin when you sin, you didn't get saved. Because the Spirit of God lives in me. The Spirit of God lives in you. And he made us a promise. He said, I'll write my laws and commands on their hearts and minds. But their sins and their iniquities, I will remember no more. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. We're going to make a confession, but I also want to do something else. Uh, Jack is here. And Jack has been going through some real uh, physical problems, cancer, in the kidneys, and, and uh, we know this. We know that there, there's a name that's above all names. And cancer is just a name. But there's a name that's above all names, and that's the name of Jesus. If I didn't believe that, I couldn't do what I do today. What I want is, I don't want any random person getting up. I'm going to say if you really believe that he's the Lord God, your healer, and you're ready to pray for somebody to receive their healing, then get up and come down here and join us. We anoint him with oil. When my leaders should be up here, I'll wonder why you're a leader. I brought that anointing home, anointing, regular anointing oil home the other day so I could visit somebody and pray for them. So this is olive oil. So you're going to smell like a salad when we're done, but <laughs> yeah, let's get it out. It'll smell better than this. She's got some better smelling oil. Yeah, go ahead. No, absolutely. But your life is important to God. That's, that's, how, that's how God is exalted. Did you yes, know that? Yes, it is. And that's what I'm trying to say. I don't yeah. want Okay. Just as long as that's clear. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. 
Absolutely. God is, is not God is not exalted by your sickness. He's exalted by your healing. Now I'm going to pray in tongues. Ira mo sondera matiche kete, rimo to sondera matike ma, imba mama koto sondera matike se, ite do soto rimo koto. Right now, in the name of Jesus, I speak healing into this body. I command every part of this body to come in line with the Word of God. That which is spoken is commandment, and there's commandment to this body to be healed and to be whole. I curse cancer in this body right now in the name of Jesus. And I speak healing into his kidneys right now. I thank you that every report from here on will be that of healing and wholeness. And Jesus, you will be glorified for being the Lord God, our healer. We thank you and we praise you for that right now. And everyone that believes and calls it so, say amen. 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 Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And, and this smells better than the, uh, the salad dressing that I have. Amen. I am the God that healeth thee. I am the Lord. Help me with that. I sent my word and healed your disease. I am the Lord, your healer. I am the God that healed thee. I am the Lord, your healer. I sent my word and healed your disease. I am the Lord, your healer. Now say, you are my Lord. You are the God that healeth me. You are the Lord, my healer. You sent your word and healed my disease. My healer. Sing that one more time. You are the God that healeth me. You are the Lord, my healer. You sent your word and healed my disease. You are the Lord, my healer. Amen. 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 Let's make this confession. Heavenly Father, I've been bought with a price. I am not my own. I belong to you. Jesus, you already paid for my sin. I have your divine favor. I receive your divine favor. Thank you for saving me today. I confess that you are my Lord and Savior in Jesus' name. Now, Father, I speak a blessing on everyone here, business, home, social, physical, mental, and spiritual. Pour out your love, your power, your grace, your spirit in such a mighty way that when the rest of the world sees them, they'll say, surely these people have been with Jesus. Amen.